We've been talking on this program about the meaning of life for several months now, and we tried to go right back to the meaning of the origin of the world, and we've discussed at some length, as those of you who have listened in during the months know, we've dealt uh, over some months in detail with the argument as to whether the world was uh, originated by time plus chance, uh, a vague evolutionary process, or whether it can be, because of the design and order in the universe, uh, tied to the existence of an intelligent mind. And then you remember we tried to look at history and discover if that intelligent mind had communicated with us in any way, and we studied the lives of people like Muhammad and Buddha, the other great religious leaders, and we studied especially the life of an unusual man that lived in the first century of our era. And you know how we then eventually ended up uh, looking at the documentation behind that ancient book that so many of us have forgotten about long ago, the book that is known in Greek as Ta Biblia, or the books, or is translated into English as the Bible. And we looked at the documentation behind that and the historicity of that book and the uh, Codex Alexandrinus and Sinaiticus and Vaticanus manuscripts that re substantiate the historicity of that uh, piece of our era and our life here on earth and eventually came to the conclusion, you remember, that this man did live the life that the Bible says he lived. Then you remember we studied his life from the point of view of finding out was he a lunatic or was he a madman or was he a liar or a deceiver or was he a legend or was he real? And so we came to the conclusion that he was real and that he actually was more than an ordinary man and was in fact the son of the creator of the universe. And if you want to go over some of those arguments or discussions, I do encourage you to write to me and I'll send you some of those cassettes from back in those studies. But we've reached the point now where we're looking particularly in connection with the meaning of life at a phenomenon that all of us know so well in our own personal lives and the meaning of that phenomenon and the way of deliverance from that phenomenon. And the phenomenon, of course, is the dual nature that all of us know so well the old Jekyll and Hyde syndrome that uh, we experience every day. We try to keep our temper with somebody who's just pulled into the traffic line in front of us. We find that suddenly all our uh, superficial veneer of civilization disappears and we become raving lunatics as we wonder to ourselves why he dared to cross the front of our car like that. Or when we go home at night, all determined to be kind and generous to our wives and to our children. And someone, of course, gives us some piece of bad news. Or the wrong piece of mail reaches our hand before we sit down to our dinner. And suddenly we become the very opposite of what we had intended to be. That's the Jekyll and Hyde syndrome. It's the discovery that inside our good nature, there seems to be an evil nature that we cannot control. It seems demonic in its strength and its power. Most of us try the sensitivity group approach. We try psychological uh, groups. We try psychoanalysis. We try reading the books on how to control your temperament. We listen to the broadcasts on the power of positive thinking. And from time to time, we think we're getting the upper hand of this nature of ours that seems so evil and so filled with self. But as the years go by, we gradually realize that we're not getting the upper hand of it at all. It's just becoming more subtle and we're becoming cleverer in our repression. And so we have come to the conclusion that there is just no way out of this hypocrisy which seems to be at the base of our lives. And yet it so often spoils our lives. We look at our wives. We want to love them with a pure and a clean heart. We want them to know that we love them, and yet there comes up before us pictures of some other woman or some other scene, and we find ourselves filled with lust at a time when we want to be filled with love and kindliness. Or we express loyalty and faithfulness to some friend, and at the same time we find rising within us a desire to take advantage of the friendship and to lie to him. And so we discover within us a dual nature, a good nature and a bad nature, 
an evil nature and a kindly nature, a loving nature and a non-loving nature, a patient nature and an impatient nature, and we wonder if two such beings can exist within the one body, except that we do know it. And we begin eventually to think we must be just schizophrenic. We're so split in our personality. And of course, we've been studying that phenomenon and studying what the meaning of it is. And you remember what we have said is the meaning of it is found in the very setup of the whole of creation. If you take the attitude that creation is just a meaningless blip in the infinite universe caused by an impersonal evolutionary process and that there is no God and no meaning to life, then you're faced with the fact that you're one of four billion other people in the world trying to scramble for as many of the material resources as you need to keep body and soul together, and you're filled immediately with all sorts of anxiety, angst, fretfulness, at times avarice and greed to get your share. And that, of course, fills you with all kinds of desire to do the other person down if it's to your advantage. And therefore, you find that there are strong desires within you that you cannot control. Now, in fact, what we've said is the bulk of mankind has been living that way from the beginning of the world. There are great numbers of men and women down through the centuries that have, li have lived as if there is no creator at all and as if they have to depend on themselves to survive. And so they have developed and bred into their children and children's children and into your forefathers and my forefathers a strong self-nature that wants its own way whatever it costs anybody else to get its way. Now, on the other hand, if you take the attitude that there is a God, that there is a creator that has made this world, and he has made you, and he knows your name, and he's counted even the hair of your head, as his son said in the first century, then you begin to realize that you can trust him and you can depend on him, that he has put you here to do a job and he will provide for you either through salary or wages or at times apart from salary or wages. But as long as you do what he has put you here to do, to play the violin or to lay bricks, to brush floors or to paint pictures, as long as you do what he has told you to do, he will somehow manage to provide for you. Then there comes into your heart and your attitude a great spirit of relaxation, an attitude of trust, and our readiness to be generous and loving to other people because you know the creator of the world will watch over you. And so there develops within you a good nature, a nature that is filled with kindliness and a love and a concern for other people. Now, what we have said is, of course, that we have uh, it's, uh, inherited this evil, selfish nature. And yet there are elements of the good nature that we find within ourselves from time to time. All of you know what it is to have generous uh, feelings towards another person, have a desire to help another person. We all know what that is. And yet we find within us this evil, selfish nature that is anxious to do the other person down if it's to our own advantage. Now, what we've said is we've tried to overcome the evil nature. Most of us have. We've tried for years and years and years, but it seems it's impossible. And the reason is that it's as old as the age itself. It's as old as the race itself. It's as old as human nature is. It has been bred into us for generations. In fact, it actually possesses a superhuman power now that is connected up with all kinds of attitudes that fill our world. And that's why we can't overcome it. It's bigger than you. It's not just you. It's not just a little shortcoming in you. It's a strong power that is abroad in our world today. And in fact, uh, the Creator knows that. And what we have said is, the Creator, because he knew that there would be this kind of power perverting our personalities, planned for a deliverance for us. He knew what you would decide to do. He knew what I would decide to do. He is cleverer than any computer. And he was able to foresee that we would decide to live in this world as if there was no creator. And that we would, in fact, pervert our personalities together with our forefathers to the point where the tendency towards anger and envy and pride and lust was so strong that we would not be able to resist it. He, in fact, foresaw that. 
And in the second second, when he conceived of our creation, he conceived of destroying us and remaking us completely again. And that is the amazing cosmic miracle that took place before the foundation of the world. He, in fact, did that. He destroyed us and remade us in his son, Jesus. And because of that, we are able to choose to live either one way or the other. We are able to be freed from this self-nature, or we are able to be enslaved to that self-nature. It is really our choice. It is up to us to decide one way or the other. Now, you may say, well, is that all that it takes to bring this cosmic miracle that took place in eternity into time? No, there is something else. There is something else that connects up with even old H.G. Wells' time machine that is miraculous in its outworking. Let's talk a little more about that tomorrow.